Thank you very much, Victoria, for joining me on this um, this chat today. So, no problem. Obviously, we have over 150 members all, over, all around the country, family businesses, big and small, all different industries. Um, and, you know, they're just our members. There's another four million odd around the UK. Um, obviously, what's the date today? It's the 9th of April. So yeah. businesses will have started furloughing their staff. Um, and then the other huge government support is the business interruption loan scheme. Yeah. Now, I know that you guys have you know, a good relationship with the bank at Castle Corporate Finance. So I thought it'd be really useful. And thank you so much for joining me to yeah. have you just talk through it in really normal terms and what's happening at the moment. And of course, this may all be completely irrelevant in a week's time. We never know, do we, these days? Well, I mean, th that, that's the thing, actually, because the goalposts are still moving a lot and very rapidly. So even that the banks are trying to stay ahead of the game, but um, as I say, the goalposts is changing all the time. So yeah, we're, we're very lucky. We have a very good relationship with a lot of the high street banks as well as other lenders. And we're really trying to talk to them as frequently as we can at the moment to understand how they're trying to get funds out to their, their customers. So the Seabill scheme has evolved itself since it was first um, put out there by the government. It's an evolution of a pre-existing scheme, the EFG, the grant from a few years ago. Um, I mean, I can't go into all the technical detail of precisely how the, the, the scheme is rolled out, but I think so that people understand the evolution of it, um, the way that some of the criteria have changed in the last week or so means that it's, it's much more accessible now than it was even a week ago. Yeah. Now, funds are only just starting to flow through this scheme. And I know initially there was sort of um, a bit of uproar about personal guarantees, 30% interest rates, the banks refusing to lend under the scheme. And initially, um, the, the Seabill scheme was very much a loan of last resort for the banks. The banks couldn't access it unless they had gone through all other options first. Um, whereas now, our understanding through our conversations with the bank is, is that that's, that's changed a bit. This is now accessible to more people um, and therefore you're not disadvantaging those who can get commercial loans but therefore can't take advantage of 12 months interest free, 12 months no capital repayments um, because they've got assets and security and so on. So that that has brought the sea bills more into a sort of a, an open arena and i think we will start to see many more of these flow through now which is great um anyone who's suffering from disruption the first port of call should be your incumbent bank um they are the ones who will know you best they will have access to your online banking details and so on so they can track what's gone before and in terms of they, they've still got to, to ask themselves the question would we have lent to this business yeah. before covid yeah but it, and your incumbent bank will be able to look back at that, at that history and have most of that at their fingertips already so hopefully that should be a tick in the box for most businesses if it isn't then get advice from an accountant an advisor whoever to say okay why why perhaps are my results not giving them that tick in the box in the first place? Perhaps you can review those prior results. Are there exceptional items? Um, are there costs that perhaps a bank should be discounting to show that you've got a viable business there and something that's taken forward? Now, a lot of startups are falling through the gap at the moment, and that's something that the banks and the government are trying to, to close. There's a lot of lobbying around startups and so on at the moment, so that's good. Hopefully, we'll see more come out. Um, but definitely speak to the incumbent banks first. Their first priority will be their current customers, um, so, and, and they will have uh, the most latitude to help. So the first things that they will try to do and what we're seeing is that the banks are trying to streamline their own internal processes to lower the hurdles to get cash out the door. And the first thing they'll do is just waive capital repayments on existing loans um, to remove that cash flow pressure. Um, they'll waive covenants if suddenly headroom on covenants is just wearing, uh, get, getting too close to line or otherwise where there would be breaches. So those are things that they can do very, very quickly. And they will look at what other kind of loan they can put in place because 
it might be that the C bills, although it gives you 12 months interest free and no capital repayments, it's a maximum six year term loan. So then servicing that debt over the following five years might actually be more pressure on a business than looking at a different commercial loan. The banks will be weighing up all those options. Okay, so essentially if I'm a small, medium sized business and my businesses have been operating fine and pre-COVID, maybe even you know on an upward trajectory, essentially if a bank would have given me a loan pre-COVID, now would be a good time to go to my incumbent bank and say, I just need your help to see me through this yeah. because in principle, coming out the other side, our business will go back to normal. Yeah, absolutely that. And again, what they're going to want to see as you go into that, they'll look back at the, the, the viability beforehand and what they want to see here and now is what steps have you already been taken to mitigate the impacts of COVID. Okay. So things like furloughing staff, um, negotiating deferral on rents, obviously taking advantage of the other government schemes that are out there, so deferring payment of VAT and so on. Yeah. Uh, that's all really important. Um, but also it's going to be things like making sure that the managers aren't still perhaps taking big salaries, yeah. dividends aren't being paid out to owners. If owners have had a whacking great dividend in the last few months, are they prepared to actually put some of that back in to support the business? over the short term as well and they really will look at those steps that you are taking to self-support in the first instance um, rather than trying to carry on regardless with a cost base that's still yeah. up here whereas in fact it could perhaps be reduced um, and then it's going to be looking at short-term cash flow so what are your overriding obligations over the next three to six months that you can't avoid and, and where's the deficit in that Okay, so if I'm a small business or a family business and I've never taken a loan before, so mm -hmm. there will be there'll be companies out there who are quite used to borrowing and it's you know it's how they've grown, but there'll be other businesses there who have just grown organically yeah. and you know are self-sustaining, but actually in order to get through the next three, six months, they're going to need some sort of help. Mm -hmm. That's a scary, scary time to suddenly yeah. be borrowing from the bank. We've never had to do it before. So what sort of advice can you offer there? Um, it, it, it's, it's similar really if you've got a current account with the bank which you will as a trading business they are the best person to speak to and especially if you have grown organically that track record will be there for them to see so you should get through those opening criteria the second thing is to understand the eligibility for the C bills and sort of have your application in order banks are under a huge amount of pressure at the moment to process vast numbers of applications for support the better shape your application can be in the smoother that process is going to be and if you haven't done it before get support get help to pull it together because it is making sure that it's presented in a funder friendly way that the banks will understand it gives them the information they need and it gives credit the information they need to sort of to push it all through so the other bits of eligibility you need to be able to satisfy one of the following the loan can't exceed double the business's annual wage bill. Okay. It can't, or it can't exceed 25% of total 2019 turnover. And it's proportionate to the business liquidity meet, sorry, needs over the short to medium term. So you've got to be able to satisfy uh, one of those at least. So it's about thinking about the relevance of your application and giving the bank what they need. Mm. Um, making it as easy as possible for them to tick the box rather than have sort of... So who is, who is someone that could help you with that? Was that someone you go to your accountant for? I mean, who, who could help you get that into shape? Your accountant certainly can, or people like us, corporate finance advisors, we certainly can. We do a lot of refinancing, a lot of debt and equity fundraising. Um, and so it's about people who can tap into the right sources of funding for you. On the whole, that's through your current bank because they're so overwhelmed at the moment that trying to look at new business they're struggling with but you've also got funders outside of the business um, the British Business Bank scheme so outside the Seabill scheme okay, yeah. who are still able to lend so if you've never raised money before you may well have assets available for security so I'm not talking about 
personal guarantees or a first child over your family home, things like that. I'm talking about a, a debtor book or stock, plant and machinery, um, freehold property within the company, things like that. Um, and if you've got those sorts of things available for security, then there are still other funding options out there for working capital, for term loans. And it's about finding an advisor who can recommend what's the right source of funding for you right now. If you're struggling with your bank, so say yeah. you don't even have a particularly good relationship with your bank manager or they're just, they're just not playing ball with what you need, is there any scope? Because I know banks are just overwhelmed at the moment, but is there any point even approaching a different bank? Yes, there is. Uh, definitely. And a number of the people we're talking to are saying, let us know if you know of businesses that aren't happy with their current relationship. But at the same time, they're saying it might take us a while to process that. Okay. So again, by going through an advisor, you're likely to get your application in front of the right person faster. Yeah. Which can help hugely because otherwise you might just go in at the back of the queue. And if they've got to do all their onboarding and their KYC, know your client and their anti-money laundering checks and so on. It's just more layers yeah. to try and get through. Um, so yeah, it, there are definitely other sources. And yes, if you're not happy with your current relationship, if a bank can't sort it out now when you need help, you need another bank. Totally. Absolutely. Okay. So have you seen people accessing this successfully and using it now? Um, it's starting to come out slowly. Um, so, no, I, I haven't seen a company come out with Siebel's, uh, a Siebel's loan um, and talking to the bankers. I know that a couple of businesses local to us have had Siebel's. I don't know them personally, but I know that they are starting to get through and the volume that they're now able to process is going up because the rules have been relaxed slightly. So whereas we had the announcement and then a bit of a, a lag and there is still a lag on these things because there's been a wealth of applications and it's in through the hopper and it's yeah, squeezing yeah. down like this squeezing out the drops um we will i think start to see these numbers ramp up and so the media won't then have quite such a field day about the government promising this the banks aren't delivering the banks are trying to do what they can do they still have to make sure that ultimately they're lending to someone who understands it is a loan and it's got to be repaid back. It, it's not unfortunately a grant or a gift. Absolutely. And, and for the sake of the entire economy, you know, as it's yeah. just free money. Okay. So before we move on, let's talk about practical steps then, because this might've been something that as a small business, I thought, yeah, that's something that we might have to, but I've never done anything like that before. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit wary. I'd rather not go down that route. And yeah. now as the weeks are going on, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to need some help here. So what is the very first thing I need to do? And then what are the steps after that? Okay, um, it's a really good question. And making sure that you've got proper um, management accounts in place, a system that generates proper management accounts on a regular basis is really important. As a manager, one should be looking at those regularly anyway, not just for what's just happened in the last couple of weeks, but also as a planning tool for how you're going to get through the next little while and as a strategic tool. So make sure you've got management accounts in place and being produced regularly. Um, try and quantify the impact that COVID has had on your business so far, whether it's sales have been dashed to nothing, whether it's redundancy costs, heaven forbid, furlough, all those sorts of things, try and quantify them. And the most important thing is going to be cash flow. So looking at a 90 day cash flow, or three month rolling cash flow as a starting point, um, so that you really can identify what the company really needs and, and have you have you asked the question of your shareholders or, or owners um, can you put some money in can senior management take some cuts themselves to ease the burden on the business um, but that cash flow forecast over the next three months and then six months looking at some reasonable assumptions of when you start to think business will start to pick up again is going to be really important okay so if you could compare like for like the last year or the last two years mm -hmm. that would help your bank see that actually this would normally say i'm a garden center this would normally be my most profitable months yeah and actually i just need something to help bridge the gap in between if you can compare like for like over the previous years yeah absolutely that yeah okay all right so that's a really good start so you've got all your money in order you've got your finances and your numbers in order where do i go now your bank manager 
whoever you've got the relationship with at your incumbent bank should be your starting point. If you're getting no luck there, then try others. It might be that you've had another bank manager trying to sort of um, chat you up for the last couple of months, couple of years. And if that's the case, then you will go in slightly higher in the queue than you would if you're just a cold, here's an application for some funding, please, to a brand new bank. Um, otherwise, speak to us, for instance, and say, right, these are the monies I need. Where am I going to get them? Where's my best bet? And if you've got those tools, that information pack, then it's far easier to tap into those who've got funding available. Okay, fantastic. So in terms of the, the risk to a business owner, what, you know, what are banks looking for as sort of guarantees? They will have to exhaust all other forms of security within the business. Anyway, I mean, that, that's commercial sense. A bank will want to look at whatever security it can. Um, so they, they will look to take debentures or charges and so on. If they've already got existing security, then they'll try and max that out. So I was talking to one funder yesterday. They've got um, a mortgage over a property that I'll, I'll use some round numbers that's worth two million that loan up to 60% of that and their current exposures at about 50%. Um, so in fact, the top up loan that they were going to put in sits comfortably within that existing security. Otherwise they'd be looking at debentures and so on. Now, um, I know there's been some press and so on about personal guarantees. And of course that's the last thing that anyone wants to be giving at the moment. When the Siebel's framework was first announced, the way that it was set up, um, and through the British Business Bank, what we were being told by the banks was that ultimately they essentially had to go for that before the government backing would kick in. Okay. I gather last week it was announced that there'll be no PGs under 250k lend. And in fact, two of the banks I was speaking to yesterday confirmed that they're not taking personal guarantees at all, nor first charges over um, a, a family home, a primary residence because that will be someone's first thing and and the press have a lot you know to answer for for things like that because actually it's, it's about just hearing that from you straight away you've got a relationship with the bank so you know straight away they're not taking personal guarantees but that will be one of the first things that, as a business owner that's that's hairy stuff it is it is i mean it, it's horrifying the last thing you want to do is potentially put your family home on the line when yeah. you're all working from home it, yeah. it's the absolute hub of, of life isn't it at the moment so yes i mean i think uh, i understand why initially it was part of the framework and banks were having to explore that i think it's excellent news if if they're not taking pgs over any of the Siebel's loans brilliant okay so worth investigating worth just calling your bank manager and just saying this is where i am this is what it looks like shall i start the process yeah i mean if, if you've got a good relationship with you then hopefully they're getting in touch with you as well and saying how are you doing yeah what support do you need are you okay at the moment keep in touch and so on what we're hearing is that a lot of the relationship managers are trying to do that of course some have much bigger portfolios of customers than others it might not get around every, everyone and some might be feeling neglected. Yeah. Um, but the answer is sort of, yeah, definitely pick up the phone, start that conversation. And if you can't get through to the bank, pick up the phone to an advisor yeah. who can help you get in at the right level to maximize the chances of that application going as close to the top of the pile as quickly as possible. You might have some very busy phone lines after this, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and and that, that's a very good point, actually, is talk about advisors because, you know, as a business owner, you don't have to go it alone. And also, you know, and I run my own business. I'm, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a bank manager. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an HR manager. Yeah. In the last three weeks, I've had to be all of those things. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it, actually, it's about support. It's yeah. about having a support network. Put your hands up and say, I need your expertise. I need your help. And actually... <laughs> I've never seen so many lawyers giving out free advice. Now is the time. Now is the time to exactly. get it. And that's yeah. okay to ask. It is exactly that. I mean, we, we speak to people who are, who are our current clients. I mean, we work with a relatively small number of clients because we're generally transaction based for mergers and acquisitions, business sales, that sort of thing. But it's a fairly small number of clients at any one time. But our black book over sort of clients of yesteryear and so on, um, and prospects we're talking to about the possibility of working with. Sometimes we're having sort of leading conversations for two, three years before we work with them. 
we're still available on the end of the phone. I closed a deal on Tuesday and they said, do you mind still being on the end of the phone? No, totally happy to. And there's, there's no fee for, for any of that. Most of the advisors around are saying, just pick up the phone and talk to us. We're so happy to do that. And by having that network of advisors around you, for whatever purpose, um, I mean, I won't have all the answers, but if you need a specific question answered, I know I can point you in the direction of someone who will have the answer, whether it's HR or yeah. a tax question, yeah. whatever it happens to be. So pick up the phone to anyone you know and say, right, this is what I need help with, rather than thinking, I, I don't know who to turn to. I don't have an HR lawyer in my back pocket. No, because let's be honest, it's the success of these businesses is everyone's interest now. Absolutely. You know, in terms of jobs, in terms of supply chain, in terms of, you know, the things we've seen in the food industry, it's just been, it's been so difficult. So, and I think everyone now has realised we all need, we're all in this together. We've all got to chip yeah. in with some advice. And if we can help one business at a time stay afloat, then yeah. better all round for the economy. Absolutely. That, that's really it. And I mean, I, I don't think any of us have been in a situation quite like this before where everybody's businesses are affected to an extent. And of course, some we're seeing have to completely and utterly mothball. Um, others we're seeing continue, but on a totally different basis. Because everyone's working remotely. I think working habits will will change forever now off the back of this, um, as people realise they can be productive from elsewhere and, and so on. I was talking to an accountant the other day, and they've got a large firm in London. They were looking at larger premises all of a sudden they've realised all their support team can work remotely. They put that on hold and they're likely to downsize yeah. as a firm. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, but yeah, we are all impacted to an extent. And yes, a lot of businesses are in survival mode at the moment. But we're also seeing that there are some businesses there who, yes, trade is affected. I mean, some businesses are having positive impact from this believe it or not some businesses in, if in the food industry care industry obviously that's risky because of, of the nature of the illness and so on but other businesses will actually benefit from what's happening yeah. um and one of the things we're saying is take action now to protect and safeguard the business as it is so you are on as strong a footing as possible to come out stronger yeah. or to come out with, with a thrive attitude rather than a survive attitude. And also, can we talk about shame? Because there is no shame in asking for help. There no. is no shame in saying I've had to furlough all my staff. There no. is no shame in saying I've needed to ask the government for the first time ever or my bank for some help. And I think there's this thing as a, as a business owner that you rock up every day with a smile on your face because everyone is looking at you for the answers. But there is no shame in saying I am doing whatever it takes to pull my business through this for the sake of my family's livelihood and yeah. that of my staff who have given okay, me I agree. Yeah. Their lives. I mean I, I think the furlough scheme is a really good one to, to mention briefly um I think any business that isn't taking advantage of it where their business where their staff are not fully utilized at the moment I, I don't see the sense in not utilizing that I mean yes goodness only knows quite how long it'll take for the HMRC portal to get up and running and the funds to come back and so on. Um, it's not going to six that. days. <laughs> well, hopefully so. Let, let's see. Um, great. I mean, that, that's fantastic. But if these things are there, then why not take advantage of them personally and in the business? It's like mortgage repayment holidays and things like that. If that's something that's going to be so if that's going to help your family and perhaps help your business because you're trying to take less out of the business at the moment yeah there is no shame in taking the help that is offered um you've got to understand the implications of it getting a Siebel's loan it is a loan you've got to repay it and you've got to be aware of what that repayment profile will look like in the future similarly you take a three-month mortgage holiday you've still got to pay that. You're not having three months waived, unfortunately. Um, but it's all the help that is out there, the government is putting out there because these are unprecedented times. Um, how many times have we heard that phrase in the last few weeks? <laughs> um, but therefore it's unprecedented measures to help people. And yeah, definitely take advantage of them. Perfect, okay. So let's talk about moving forward. Because you're yeah. right, you need to have 
an attitude of optimism and that, you know, how we're going to thrive rather than just survive. So, so talk to me a bit more about that. Okay. Um, most businesses will have had a plan before this all kicked off. We certainly did. We, we announced last year, right, we're on a three year growth plan. We're building the team um, and so on. And of course, that's all gone on pause slightly to an extent, but it should be a pause, not necessarily a step right backwards and, and start from scratch again. Pause and monitor things in the right way and perhaps take the opportunity to catch up on boring admin, compliance stuff, filing, whatever it happens to be that sometimes doesn't get done when you're running around at full speed. Um, but also have a look at what does that business plan look like going forward. Monitor it and adapt it now for where we are and look at where you want to be in six months time, 12 months time uh, and beyond. For some people, this might be the last straw. Okay, I I've done this enough with all the Brexit uncertainty for the last three Brexit? years. What's that? What? No. <laughs> now that was one hell of a way to change the conversation, wasn't it? <laughs> wasn't it, <Jack? laughs> um, But after surviving all the uncertainty of Brexit over the last few years, and now this, I've had enough. Okay, what do I need to do to put in place for succession? because I, I, for my mental health, physical health, whatever it happens to be, I don't want to go through this again. Or it's, well, actually, no, I've, I've taken stock and I know that there's an opportunity out there. Other people are going to be looking the same. There's gonna be swings and roundabouts here. Some people will want to exit, some people will want to acquire coming out of this. Um, goodness only knows when and how, but I think there will be some movement in the market um, in the future as we come out of this but it's having having a vision still for where you want to be and what you want to achieve and start taking the first few steps down that path just because things are still uncertain at the moment doesn't mean that you can't keep moving forward there might be very small incremental steps but now's an opportunity to start to perhaps get ducks in a line um, and make sure that you're ready to to take bigger strides forward uh, when the opportunity arises, when this down, when hopefully the, the, the virus, we flatten the curve um, and, and it dies down and then the restrictions are lifted, children go back to school, then I think we'll start to see um, activity pick up. And uh, yeah, it's about being in the right place to take advantage of that. There will be new funding needs that come out of the back of that, not just survival funding, but a lot of working capital funding for businesses as things start to pick up, suddenly the wage bill ticks up. You've got to pay your VAT that you've deferred from this quarter. Um, and so I think banks are going to be lending more again then, but on more traditional terms um, to help support businesses as they pick up speed again. So it's thinking about this as a, as a pause rather than a going backwards. And, it, and for some businesses, particularly family businesses, you know, they've been through world wars. I mean, we're talking about yeah, businesses that are yeah. generations and generations. And like you say, this might just be enough is enough, you know, and that's okay. Yeah. It's okay to think about an exit, a succession, a sale, or whatever it might be. But also for, for businesses that do feel like they can make it through this, mm. has this not really sharpened everyone's focus on, okay, yeah. we figured out how we can make money and how we can make money quickly how we can adapt overnight. And it might it certainly made me think, I was just a busy fool before. I was faffing around with that and faffing around with that. And actually yeah. I realized what it is that people really want and what they really need from me. Yeah, yeah. Should, that, that has opened our eyes, this Absolutely. terrible experience. So um, I think going back to what we were saying a little bit earlier um, about some working habits, I think, um, what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention, yeah. isn't it? And I think the innovation that we'll see come out of this could be incredible. Um, and I think we'll see business models evolve to be more flexible, um, whether that's just for the workforce or needing by necessity to work in a different way. Now that might be a short term change to the business model because you don't have another choice, right? For now, we can't keep the shop open, so we're going to home delivery. It's better than doing no, no sales at all. Um, but it, it might, that there might be a shift where actually you carry on with version two of the business model that you're running now if there are efficiencies that it can add to the business. So I think we will see a lot of businesses um, alter 
uh, the way they do things off the back of this. And it's about making sure that going forward, you find the right way for you and the, the right way for the business ultimately to maximize efficiencies and, and make profits, um, but possibly with a different balance involved as well. Absolutely. And, and someone, one of our family business I was speaking to yesterday said all of a sudden there are things about his staff that have come to the fore and they are shining in these new roles yeah. as before they might have been tucked away in a warehouse somewhere. Now they're delivering to customers and actually customers love it, you know, and you have to find a glimmer of hope in all of this uncertainty, don't you? And, 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 it's, and we've realised that it's all about people because actually the bricks and mortar that we're in, the fancy technology that we use, it's all great but we're nothing without those people. And that's been a real revelation, I think, for lots of businesses. I think so, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's where some businesses are, are, are struggling um, emotionally, if you like, with the remote working, because when you're used to being all in one place, yes, you've got the technology and we've got the likes of Zoom and Teams and goodness only knows what now, which is great, but it's, it doesn't replace human interaction, not completely. So I think people are now settling down into it. I, I did a, a post on LinkedIn the other day. So I, I think the initial uncertainty has given way to a more pragmatic, okay, well, we know where we're at now. A new normal. Calm down. Yeah, we're starting to get used to this new normal. I think it'll continue to evolve. And I think depending on how long we're on lockdown for, people are going to need a lot of resilience to stay strong and keep that support going uh, and again this is where interactions like this are really important i'm spending more time on calls of course at the moment than ever before um not just with my team which i speak to, i speak to most of them daily um but with the wider network to understand how they're finding it how they're coping with it how's their business doing um and that's banks it's lawyers it's accountants but it's businesses they're all in business of whatever way shape or form um, and, and that that mutual support that interaction however we can find it I think is really important stuff fantastic okay so as someone who has an insight into the way banks are thinking and working and, and financials in general any last nuggets of wisdom or you know questions that are being asked of you a lot that you think would help our audience of people running family businesses um, I think when you're, when you're asking for funding, make it as difficult as you can for the bank to say no by making sure you've got all the relevant information together and put it together in a way that is as easy for them to digest as possible. And if that means getting some help to put it together, um, either because you don't have a full-time FD or finance controller or heaven forbid they're off sick or furloughed, something like that, get the help, get the advice to make sure that pack is really put together because then when it gets in front of your bank manager they can look at it and kind of go yeah I I'm happy with all of this I can see all the information's there you tick all the eligibility boxes I can pass that straight to credit and, and it will just make the process that much smoother because the cash flow requirement is now it's not six weeks time people need cash now and uh, yeah it it's about getting to the top of that queue as quickly as possible Brilliant. thank you so much no worries at all. Hope it's been helpful.